Welcome to UCLA Extension's Department of Business Management and Legal Programs video lecture series on entrepreneurship, new venture formation, and strategic business plan development. This video gives instructions on how to develop an a market analysis, basically an introduction to the point of entry into an industry. I'm Harry Redinger, your instructor. There is a total of over 40 videos in this lecture series that integrate with our UCLA Extension Department of Business and Management's online course management program, Canvas. Each video strives to be brief and will have a little overlap with each other to tie our curriculum together. Okay, let's get started. Our first slide here is kind of an abstract slide. It kind of sets the, uh, the mindset that we want to have <clears throat> as we go into the process of developing a market analysis. Yeah, I use this very same slide to introduce how to develop an industry analysis uh, for the uh, same reason. And that's because this is a section of the business plan or the process of understanding the industry you're getting into as an entrepreneur or someone who's starting a new venture. There is potentially an endless amount of information uh, out there in the marketplace that that you want to be aware of to um, to fully understand the, the marketplace and the point of entry into the marketplace. So the concept behind this particular image up here, this is what's referred to as a titration in chemistry. And a titration is a way of, of determining the percent of something in something else, or in this case, uh, um, a good example is the percent of alcohol that is in the liquid in this, in this beaker. And a titration is where we can put drops of a chemical into the solution and by counting the number of drops into the solution that has a known volume, uh, that we can, uh, at some point, the solution will turn color from, from clear to purple uh, or pink. And, and then we can count the number of drops up on a chart uh, per the volume and see what is in that point where it turns colors is what we refer to as a point of supersaturation. And, um, and at the same point, we can look up and say, well, what percent of alcohol is, is in that particular liquid? Well, when we go into the marketplace to acquire information on the market, the point of entry into the industry, um, at the point of supersaturation, at the point that we know the industry well enough that we can have dialogue, conversation about it, that this is when we're ready to start actually developing uh, the information, the, the uh, industry analysis section. We don't want to copy and paste information off the internet into it. We want to know it well enough that from the heart, from the mind, that we can just have dialogue with someone about it. And once we know how to uh, profile and explain the four sections of a market analysis, that's when we're ready. So I share this with you just so you know when it's time to stop doing research and start actually writing going forward with the process of your business plan or with the process of developing your business model for um, uh, your entrepreneurial venture. Um, the next slide I, I'm going to share, and I, I share the slide much uh, throughout our lecture series, and this is an image of Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. And the reason why I have this up here, as we go through and research and assemble the uh, articles, the information necessary to complete our a market analysis, we want to be aware of, of changes, small changes that are occurring right now in the marketplace that, that might in fact lead to 
Pandemics in Demand, because this book is all about how to detect how little differences can create a uh, huge demand for what you're, you're, you're selling as a business. So every day, every week, every quarter, um, uh, uh, things change. And if we're looking for them, if we're aware of them, that, uh, that uh, as they're discovered, we now can say, well, my gosh, if I taking this knowledge of, of this trend in market demand, that we can tweak our mission statement, our, uh, our vision of success, our, our phase of competitive development to take advantage of this. So we want to be very aware of opportunities as we go through this process of assembling the four parts of a market analysis. Um, so as we stand on the, the threshold of the market analysis, the most important thing we have to understand about a market analysis is, is how to, to profile uh, the point of entry into the market, such as supply and demand, demographics, psychographics, um, uh, competitive advantages that we have over a competitor, our position in the marketplace. Um, uh, so, so but the bottom line is we need to make very clear uh, from the standpoint of profiling whom we're selling to and who our competitor is. Who are we going to be doing economic uh, battle with? And uh, so much of the mission statement stuff is reflected in here. And here is also where we start to understand how we're going to crack the market, how we're going to compromise barriers of entry to get into the market, capture market share, and survive the whole process of a business launch. Market analysis is all about the point of entry in the market. So we have a, you know, a magnifying glass. We want to study um, our point of entry. Now, we, uh, we want to state also that in the industry analysis, explain how the industry works nationwide, worldwide. But the conditions of the market here in Los Angeles could be totally different than Boston or Chicago or New York or something like that. So market conditions change based on the point of entry. So the requirements to get started in a market in Dallas, Texas or uh, or or uh, Sacramento, California, could be totally different than what it would be in Chicago or Boston or something like that. So we got to be aware of it. Things change, and this also requires boots on the ground. We have to live the market. We, this has got to be where we understand and can meet uh, the consumer. This is something that you really can't learn from books. You've got to go meet people. You, this is where experience comes, comes into play. I want to um, <clears throat> profile some of the objectives of a market analysis. Um, first, it's to define the point of entry into the market. We often use maps to do this, maps and diagrams to do this. Uh, second, we want to review the market's level of supply and demand. So. Um, you know, the, what's the millions of dollars of demand for our product and services, and, and then what level of uh, supply, meaning competitors, are, are out there supplying that demand. And so, you, you know, later we're going to define what's a, a market opportunity. In essence, a market opportunity is where there's more demand than there is supply. I mean, duh. Uh, and, and perhaps, even in cases where there's more supply than demand, if you differentiate yourself, this gets back to Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, if you differentiate yourself just right, you might be able to find new pockets of demand that your competitors are asleep at the wheel with. Uh, next is profiling the market's consumer. You know, all businesses that are successful know their consumer like the back of their hand. They, they know their favorite colors. They know what they do on weekends. Uh, so a key to success is knowing your customer and, and what they really want, what they need versus what they want. And we're going to talk about that. And I got a little video clip that's really going to drive home, you know, the importance of, of, that, of having that kind of knowledge. The next is profile the market's competitor. Um, who you're going to do, you know, uh, battle with. 
I always like to think of this as, you know, Star Wars, Luke Starworker with a, with a lightsaber. Bzzz, <laughs> you know, to go out and, and, and doing battle in the marketplace. But truly, um, you know, we live in a, um, you know, a, a capitalistic economy and we have competitors and we have to compete with them in quality, cost, time. And, uh, and, we, and the more we learn about them, the better we're going to understand how to compete with them. If we don't know what we're competing against, it's really going to be hard to, uh, to uh, uh, capture customers with your advertising campaign because you're not going to really be aware of, of what the customers mean and what the, what the competition's doing. They, they might have many years of experience and a, and a particular way of, 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 of taking care of their customer. And so being aware of how they do what they do is going to be important knowledge for you, but it also might uh, introduce you to things they could be doing that they're not be do doing and, and, and how you might capitalize on filling that gap. Profile the company's market position. So early in our lecture series, we talk about how to do a SWOT analysis, and that's a part of case study analysis and, 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 and strategic planning process. So a SWOT analysis, what are the strengths, the weaknesses, and opportunities and threats? Well, we, we within the context of doing a market analysis, want to document what we perceive our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and threats in the marketplace. And by laying that out there, the reader of our business plan or just knowledge and our colleagues and, and staff and management are, are going to be aware of it. The more we're aware of this, the more likely we are to be prepared for it. So if we know our strengths, we know what to sell. If we know what our weaknesses, we know how to protect them. Um, if we um, <clears throat> uh, know our uh, opportunities, we know how to align our resources to go after them. And we know our threats, we know how to to have our guard up and being aware of these situations when, when they apply. Identifying market opportunities. So in the process of going through developing our market analysis, we no doubt are going to stumble across opportunities that we didn't realize getting into it. And as we'll touch on on the end of our lecture here, um, this is where again Malcolm Gladwell's book The Tipping Point comes in, because if we can identify these, we then also might need to go back and modify our mission statement, our vision of success statement, our organizational structure or business model, and our phase of competitive of development to um, take advantage of these market opportunities. Next is when you would outline our market threats and uh, our outline market threats and market threat solutions. This is basically saying these are our anticipated problems and this is how we're going to deal with it. So by being able to uh, identify things that are threats or uh, things that we are our weaknesses and uh, as we launch into the business and then solutions for each one, we're going to be just a bit more prepared. So the more we're prepared, the more we practice and train uh, to, uh, uh, to defend ourselves and take a, uh, advantage of opportunities when, they're, uh, when they appear, the more instinctively we, we will in doing this. So as I've mentioned in, in many uh, lectures to this point, or slides to the point, you know, one of my favorite authors is... Um, um, uh, 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 Rick Pitino in the book uh, Success is a Choice and this is where we where we uh, profile uh, what an athlete or competitive athletic team goes through in terms of practicing plays over and over and over and over and over again and being aware of threat situations and opportunity situations and practice them uh, from a strategy standpoint as a company management staff over and over and over and over again when they appear we just seize the moment we take advantage of it if we're not aware of it if we're not practicing for it um, a threat could come come about and take us down as a business or an opportunity to come back we could just be blind to, to even knowing it's there so the more that we can identify and establish opportunities and threats uh, uh, relevant to our weaknesses and opportunities um, and strengths uh, the better we are to respond when these conditions uh, present themselves you know, much of uh, our market analysis section deals with um, 
uh, our advertising, our marketing programs are becoming aware of, of, of how we're going to develop what we call a marketing mix of, of how we're going to do our advertising, how we're going to understand the market. And I want to introduce you to what's referred to as a marketing, the marketing mix for peace. You can Google this. This is an established concept. There's also another one we're going to touch on called the marketing mix seven P's and there's three additional P's that can be added to it. But fundamentally, we have to be very, very aware of these four P's of, of a marketing mix, of, of uh, the mix of understanding our market. The first P is product, and our product has to align with the needs and desires of the customer, uh, the client. Um, the does it fit the task at hand? I mean, this is dumb logic, but it's totally possible that you, the <clears throat> overly enthusiastic entrepreneur, might develop a product as sur and service that's what you think the customer wants, but it's not what the customer wants. It's 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 missing the sweet spot. <clears throat> it's we never you you never took the time <clears throat> to really find out what the customer needs and wants, because what they need might be different from what they want. So you kind of have to understand this. And, and a lot of this understanding comes into what we refer to as the eighth P, which we're going to talk about in just a second, in a great video clip on this. So let's just be aware of our product service alignment to the marketplace. Uh, the next is place. This has to do with uh, product distribution. So if we've got a product and service that we want to sell to a customer or client, we've got to also have a way to get to them. Uh, so it's going to be community convenient or it's going to be something that can be disseminated through the internet in some kind of way such as um, you know video conferencing or uh, downloadable books and PDFs versus actually print the book and put it in the mail and, and mail it to somebody. But we have to be very aware of how we're going to distribute um, our goods and services to our target uh, customer client. Um, next is our price. Our price, I mean, obvious, obviously, boy, if you're off on your price point, uh, it's, it's the kiss of death. So we, we have to clearly understand the relationship between um, our, our mission statement, what are we selling, to whom we're selling, what makes it competitively different, and our and a price, because if we're trying to be a J.C. Penney's with a Nordstrom price or vice versa, we got a big problem. And the, again, this is where uh, experience comes in. And when we get into our competitive strategy sections, there's a there's a, ho a whole strategy called our price strategy, and how we come up with that, and how we define and explain that. So price is a part of developing, um, uh, understanding our marketplace. The next is our promotion, ads, advertising, public relations, sales promotions, uh, sales point, uh, 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 direct sales personnel, um, and uh, social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, uh, um, power and influence, uh, personal references, networking, it all goes in. How, what is the mix of promotions that you're going to use to promote your products and services to your customers, clients in the marketplace? And that has to, again, be in balance with distribution, place, uh, the alignment of the type product and services, and price. These all are interconnected. And we have to understand all four of these concerns, these four P's of of, of your, your marketing mix um, to develop a well uh, uh, thought out marketing program, marketing strategy. That's all a part of your market analysis. Now I want to talk about ex the extended, uh, the uh, the uh, seven P's, and so there's actually three additional P's of the marketing mix that we want to present. The first four are just integrated with each other, and so the next three are going to take a little more of a dynamic approach to things that we really need to understand to uh, 
understand the point of entry into a market. And the first one here is people. You know, all companies are reliant on people who run, run them from front to back, uh, sales to management. So we, we need to, we, we, we want to make sure that the point of entry into the market has the qualified people to uh, staff and run the company. So, you know, if we, were to, we start a company out in a, in a market point of entry, it's out, you know, in, in nowhere, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, it's going to be kind of hard to find the qual qualified people, perhaps, to, to do what you do. If it's high tech, we probably need to be close to a high tech type hub, Silicon Valley or, you know, something like that. Or we're the Bay Area, um, you know, and there's a number of, of high-tech hubs that are emerging all over the nation. But obviously, if we're going to be a, a company that pro pro provides goods and services that are high-tech uh, uh, computer or internet type things, we've got to be close to people who can do coding and understand or technology that can understand this stuff. The next here is process. Um, uh, how you deliver your service and, and how it's done, uh, uh, the process of manufacturing, uh, the value added that comes from maybe the unique way that you assemble things. Um, and and one, once again, this is, um, you know, th this is one of the things the customer pays for. Also, going back to the mission statement, what are we selling and to whom we're selling and then the next sentence, what makes us competitively different in the marketplace and thus process can, is often what differentiates you, the aspect that differentiates you in the marketplace, why some customers are going to hire you versus someone else. So, and when we start getting into uh, st uh, researching our competitor, me might find out that they use a totally different process. It might be an, a dying, outdated process. So understanding our process relevant to what attracts the customer client to us is very important and might be an, an aspect uh, that you may overlook that, and, and, and thus be missing out on, on, on opportunities. Physical evidence, you know, this, this deals with, um, you know, the, uh, so much of how products and services are sold are intangible uh, some because people buy you first and what you're selling second but we still have they have to have the evidence the testimonials that it works and so as we go into a market we want to make sure that we um, uh, regardless of uh, how we differentiate and our our jingles and slogans and culture and all that kind of stuff and it's all important but we also have to have the evidence that uh, our, on our competency, uh, uh, that our product service works, um, it's a viable solution, and we have the evidence to show that. Um, here's the eighth P that I want to talk about of, in the marketing mix, and it basically says the product, uh, product and, uh, productivity and quality. Um, this P asks, is what you are offering your customer a good deal? You know, there's a saying, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, so sometimes people are attracted to you for really hard to understand reasons, but it's important that you do understand these reasons. And where the problem lies here, and here, let me just finish reading this. Um, this is less about you as a business improving your own productivity for cost management and more about how your company uh, passes this onto its customers and clients. So the magic of what you do and how you do what you do, um, though may save money, may be a really fabulous alignment with um, your personality and your passions and all that stuff, um, which makes everybody a happy camper. But we have to also bear, bear in mind what we're selling and how we're selling. So how it satisfies your personal needs is in a way irrelevant to the importance of it satisfying your customer. And being aware of what your customer really wants and needs, uh, and they might want something but really need something else, and then how do you do the switch switcheroony kind of, of uh, market development uh, uh, tactic? Um, uh, 
Uh, well over 20 years ago, one of my students is Clark Voce, and Clark uh, was, uh, I think, took my class about my th after my, my third year of teaching at UCLA Extension. I'm, I'm going into my 24th year now. And, um, uh, and this is before, uh, 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 back then, Clark nor I had gray hair. We both have gray hair. But Clark went on to form a very successful market branding consulting company. And he's worked with some just really big, big name um, uh, organization, <clears throat> Red Bull. Uh, 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 there's a whole, whole list, but I do know he's done some really big uh, projects with, with Red Bull. Um, the the energy drink company, and um, I'm going to play a, a video here uh, uh, of just about a two minute section introduction to to Clark. Th this is a um, uh, he he frequently guest speaks to my UCLA classes, and this is about an hour long video uh, or 45 minutes or so video. But I'm only going to play about two minutes of the video in the upfront that really summarizes the, 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 the real gist of the importance of understanding brand marketing. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start this video and come back in about two minutes. Um, so I understand uh, that you are here to turn a, a, um, learn about factors essential for turning a great idea into a successful business. So. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and, um, and we'll take some lessons from that. But I want to start, uh, as Harry said, my name is Clark Vautier. Pronoun it's French, pronounced Vautier, like you're voting. Um, and I want to start with uh, this quote. And if, if I teach you nothing else tonight, I want to leave you, I want to start and, and end with this quote. It's the most important quote I believe I can give you. And it's, there's nothing more irrelevant than what I think you need. And I think this is, this is the key to uh, success for any entrepreneur. It's when you really think about this quote and really what it means, people don't buy what they need necessarily. We all need, we all know we need certain things, but we buy what we want. So you've got to tap into your target audience with your product. You've got, you've got to basically, sort of like a Trojan horse, you've got to deliver what they want and also give them what they need. But you don't necessarily lead with what they need. Does that make sense? So if there's one idea, concept that I can instill in you, it's, it's this. And this, this quote, it's a simple quote, but it's, there's a lot to it. And I'll, I'll keep coming back to it as, as we go through my slides. But just think about it in context of what you're trying to do. And, and a good example is we, we, we fall in love with our own ideas sometimes, a lot of times, especially if you're starting up a new business. And that can, that's a good thing because you, you should be passionate. And as Harry said, people buy you first, the product second. So you need to be passionate about what you're selling. But you can't fall in love with it so much that you don't meet the market um, where it wants to be met. So that's kind of the essence behind this quote. You've really got to, um, you've got to read, read, know, and understand your market um, so that you know exactly what they will buy, what they will want, as opposed to, you know, it's sort of think about how often do you listen to your parents when they give you advice, right? They know what you need, um, but it may not be necessarily what you want. So um, think of it in that context. So I, want to, I just wanted to start. Okay. Um. So, uh, words of wisdom, and just so, the, you know, the important take home from that little clip is just, you know, try to set your, once you master your passions and what your, your mission statement, what you're selling, to whom you're selling, and what makes you competitively different, gosh, really take the time to talk to your, your customer, your client, and understand what is it they, they really want. I, and a lot of people, you know, surveys kind of suck because who wants, who likes filling out surveys? But you know, I encourage you to actually go m meet with people, do do lunch, do coffee, do do cocktails. Um, but you know, have the have the pointed question: What is it that you truly like about my practice or me? Um, you know, what what is it that that you, you really want or really need, or the, you know, what may what in your eyes, what makes 
what we do uh, unique and why you are one of our customers or clients. The more you do that, the more you ask that question, the better you're going to understand. And that might be some really, really valuable information in um, uh, developing and growing your business. I want to now take a look at uh, the uh, four parts of a market analysis. The first part is uh, profiling the market region. And again, as I mentioned, we often use a map. The second is profiling the target customer, whom we're selling to. This is mission statement stuff. What are we selling and to whom are we selling? So this is going to get into demographics, psychographics. Um, you know, the demographics might be covered in profiling the market region, but the demographics here is where we're going to get into values and, and what, why people make the decisions they do. Um, we have a whole slide on that in just a minute. And then we also need to uh, profile our competitor. Who, who do we have to steal customers from? Who do we have to acquire market share from? Um, so the better we understand our competitor, the more successful we are in, in compromising the barriers of entry into the industry and surviving in the industry once we get there. And then fi finally, profiling our position in, in the industry, a, a, a SWOT analysis in terms of profiling our market position in our own industry. Okay, so let's now talk about um, profiling the mar market region. Um, this actually, this slide is kind of a overview of everything we're going to talk about in a bit in a bit but first off up here um, and this is just just a way of looking at all of what we're getting into before we get into it kind of an overview um, this is kind of a four four step process here but our step one is define uh, uh, define and target your market so how you know, let's write it out. How could we, how would we define our marketplace of 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 where of who we're trying trying to get to, who we're targeting? Okay, so you got the overall market, but then here's all the potential customers. But but then here's the statistical most likely to based on what makes us competitively different. Uh, we'll buy from us or hire us customers. So can we do it? And then can we outline the market structure? The structure of the market in terms of the categories of customers that we sell to, the, um, the methods and techniques by which we get to these customers. Can we, can we come up with any kind of diagram that's got categories and boxes in it? You know, if we don't do this, it's kind of like shooting in the dark. The more, the better we have a target, we can we can aim. You know, we can we can, you know, uh, target our marketing at. But if we don't, we're just you know we're putting expensive marketing out in the in the market, and we might or might not hit the spot. Um, the second step is define and target your customer. Whom are we selling to? This gets into the, the psychographics. So once we got the market established, now we've got to really take a look at who's in that market that's most likely going to buy goods and services from us. And now we have to understand the psychographics. We then want to measure our customer base. So the better we understand whom we're selling to, can we now figure out what percent of the market are these people? Are they 1%, 2%, 10%, 50%, 75%? Because once we know that, we can take the price point of our profit centers, our goods and services, and start multiplying that out based on the percent of, uh, of people, potential, statistically most likely customers, and now we can put a price on the value of the market. And, and when you do this, by the way, it can be really eye-opening. You might not have any idea how much opportunity is out there until you really start to take a look at, you know, most likely to hire us customers in the marketplace, the price point of our goods and services, and multiply those two together. And sometimes that can be a really big number. Um, I mean, in the millions of dollars kind of number. And, um, and that, so all this might bring much new insight into what your real vision of success statement is. 
the third step here is defining the <clears throat> defining and targeting your competitors. Um, who's going to try to put us out in business? Who's going to undercut us? Who's going to look at us as competition? And so we then need to assess what advantages we have over those competitors. So. Um, who are competitors, what are their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, etc. What are our strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities, etc. Our SWOT analysis. And then how can we capitalize on any differences there? Um, so in our advertising material and our direct sales and things like that, we can call to our, our potential customers and clients the, uh, uh, what makes us different and why you want to hire us. So, and, and by the way, this kind of information wants to not just happen uh, at the process of getting into the market for the first time. This is a perpetual process that we always want to be aware of because things change daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, etc. Finally, we want to summarize our uh, market analysis with SWOT analysis, with the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the whole market, not just our position, but the whole market and being aware of that. Um, we want to talk a little bit about um, targeting uh, your market. And I, uh, this is kind of a cool graph. Uh, uh, and so uh, this is UCLA and Los Angeles, kind of our, our point of entry. So I've got a little magnifying glass in Los Angeles there. But, um, but we want to be um, you know, aware of how we're going to segment the market. So much of market development deals with subject matters of market segmentation. How are we going to divide this market out so that when we target our social networking, our direct mail, our direct sales, our, our blanket newspaper advertising, you know, radio, TV, all that kind of stuff, we have to be really, really aware of how we're segmenting the market to get to the person we really are our most likely customer. Because the more effective we are in our market development program, needless to say, the more successful we'll no doubt be as a business. So there's geographic concerns, there's psychographic concerns, there's behavioral concerns, there's demographic concerns. So we add this all up in terms of geographic location, uh, demographic of who they are and what part of the demographics are we, we targeting, you know, uh, behavioral type uh, uh, things in terms of politics and po political and, and lifestyle kinds of stuff. And then psychographics, you know, behaviors, um, value structures, you know, these all come into play to how we segment the market to like almost think of them like filters, like sunglass filters that we put on, and and what shows up at the end of all these looking through these filters is exactly who you're marketing to. The better you understand who you're trying to get to, needless to say, you're just going to be much more effective in how you design, develop, and distribute to market uh, development material. And then when you meet these per people for the first time to do one-on-one -on -one sales. Um, you're just going to be so much more effective in doing what you're, you're uh, uh, doing to achieve your objectives. Um, so I just for the, you know, funny, in terms of profiling the point of entering the market, let's, so if we said the, you know, the greater Los Angeles area, um, uh, so it doesn't take, so if we go, and, and this is one of the beauties of the internet now, because I've been in this business long enough that I remember when, there was not the internet. Um, uh, the very first class I taught at UCLA in 1993, uh, there was over 30 students in the class and only one student had an email address. Can, can you Im only imagine how much things have changed? So if we Google uh, greater Los Angeles market area demographics, we will find paragraphs like this, really nicely written paragraphs. And here's one case where you can copy and paste. Um, but these are, you know, uh, and, and much of this kind of information you can also be acquired through Chamber of Commerce, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, both these paragraphs are just copied and pasted out of, uh, of a Google search on Greater Los Angeles Market Demographics. And I mean, it talks about the five counties, 
uh, the number of people, the residents, and, and the various different you know, counties. So we have about 17.8 million residents that are in the area uh, per the, ninth, uh, the 2015 census. It also you know, has a comparison with New York. You get a feel for you know, how large our market is here. Um, so you, so our, our business plan, our business model, our, our knowledge wants to have kind of an idea of how many people are in our market area. Now we're going to start taking a look at, of all the people in the market area, what percent of those are potential customers and which are, are most likely to hire us customers if we can get our, our market uh, and development information to them. Um, just be aware that the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, every market has some kind of Chamber of Commerce, and their job is to promote uh, uh, the, the marketplace to uh, businesses to have them come in. And because uh, with that com comes taxes, so you know, city government pays for this. They they give big contributions to help get them off the ground because the Chamber of Commerce goes out and promotes uh, this area to businesses, and that's where they get business revenue, uh, tax revenue, sales tax re revenue. And uh, these uh, chambers of commerce will often have um, uh, brochures, pamphlets on uh, the demographics of the greater Pasadena area or Long Beach area or Santa Monica area. So by, by simply going to their Chamber of Commerce, you can get a really neatly organized, you know, in terms of number of households, uh, adults per household, children per household, number of cars, um, average income, average education. I mean, just a lot of really great information. Um, also, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce website, you can probably get a lot of that without, without even walking in a Chamber of Commerce uh, door. Also know that uh, most public libraries have national, state, and regional uh, Chamber of Commerce type directories that uh, profile a lot of this basic information on a national level. So just know that through the Chamber of Commerce, there's, there's a lot of this demographic information out there, and it's very easy to get your hands on. Next, we want to talk about how to profile our target customer. And by the way, uh, th this is the essence. Uh, this aspect of, of, of entrepreneurship, uh, new venture formation, is just so essential. Boy, if you don't understand your customer, and don't understand your competitor, you're, you know, now you can start to understand why 80% of businesses fail within the first two and a half years. It just, you know, you just can't make mistakes. Uh, you, you've got, the more you're on target here, the more you're going to have a very successful, very fun, exponential growth kind of experience. But without this knowledge, you could be cruising for a huge life in financial bruising. So here goes. Um, this is a, a graphic up here that Al, you know, kind of start, it talks, it talks about seven categories of whom you're selling to. And we're going to drill down in all seven of these categories in terms of better understanding our target market. Um, so, I'm right, we're just, so we're just asking questions, whom are we selling to? And these seven um, um, uh, categories of client customer profiling, it's going to give us a lot of insight in terms of what to look for and what to understand to better profile our customer. The first area is our, um, our of understanding our, and all of these deal with our understanding our target market. But first off is the industry. Excuse me. So what we mean by this is, um, what we mean by this is if you're, let's say you're an office supply uh, business, and clearly if we did an industry analysis, we would do an SIC code uh, research on op the office supply industry. But let's say you sell office supplies specifically to the legal industry, attorneys. And, and all the many other types of businesses that, that play a role within the legal industry. And so if this is the case, then needless to say, you would probably need to know and want to know a lot of information about how law firms work, 
uh, laws, regulations, trends, and all that stuff relevant to the law industry, even though it's not the industry you're in, but it's the industry that you sell to. So you want to understand the industry and or industries, if relevant, that you your mission statement uh, targets or identifies as the, the whom you're selling to. So you want to um, understand uh, the industry or industries of your, if they exist, it, of your customers. Because if you're just selling to, you know, the residents or customers, regardless of what they do, then this is this is not applicable. Next is understanding, of, as far as targeting your market, understanding the size of the organization or the value, the uh, annual income of, of the customer, but how big they are. So are we going after six-figure income individuals or are we, do, are we going after companies that have 25 or more employees or 50 or a uh, million and more in sales? So if size is relevant and we're trying to be at some kind of defined sweet spot, in size, then we want to know that. <clears throat> for instance, for selling individuals, and and be given what we're selling is that if an individual is not clearing a you know six figure income as a family, <clears throat> then they are probably won't be able to afford it. That's a good question to ask. So we want to be aware of this, and if applicable, we want to document it because this has a lot to do with how we segment, quote unquote, segment the market. If you're too little or if you're too much, uh, you're not the just right category. So we want to understand whom we're selling to from a size standpoint and preferably somehow that's identified in our mission statement. Um, cute graphics here. Um, if our target market is defined in any way by technology, um, either a master of technology or or doesn't understand any technology. You know, the other day I was getting, I was dropping my car off at my uh, mechanic to have the oil changed and looked at and all, you know, just, just you know, maintenance. And I was chatting with him, and, um, and this guy's really good. I mean, he's really, really good. But he works on cars. He doesn't work on computers or technology or educational videos and all this kind of stuff. And he wanted to share me with something on his website because he's having problems with the guy who develops his website. And um, he shows me his, the logo on his business card that's on the website. And I asked him, do you have a JPEG of the, uh, of the image? And he looked at me and goes, what's that? I, well, I mean, if you have anything to do with graphics or, you know, Photoshop or any kind of mild application of, of technology, you know what a JPEG image is. So <clears throat> anyway, so I have this guy, you know, with a, you know, a tin can, because and for those of you who might not know, if you take two tin cans, poke a hole in the center and tie a string, pull the string tension on it, and the, 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 the round part of the tin can is like a diaphragm. So if you talk in the tin can, it'll make that diaphragm you know, vibrate, which sends the vibration down the string to the other tin can, and if someone puts their ear to it, it works like a telephone. Pretty crude, but you know, it's a form of communication. So, <clears throat> So anyway, the point of this particular um, uh, category is if there's some unique application of technology that differentiates, that, that can be used to segment uh, your target customer, you want to write that down. You want to be aware of that. So our, our next slide here um, deals with price point. Uh, so some customers are hypersensitive about price. A, a good example is the mechanic I was just talking to you about. Um, he, uh, he does not, I mean, less than 10% of his customers are new car customers. Uh, the majority of the customers are people like me that are keeping an old car going for a host of reasons. And, but it's important to me to have a, a really competent uh, a mechanic. I mean, the person I'm talking to is the person who's actually working on the car. It's not a sales rep. Um, and I have a certain kind of reassurance that based on the relationship I have with him, it's almost like a, a doctor-patient, because I depend on that car to start when I sit the key in. And, and, and it means much to me to know that the guy I'm working with is, is uh, just a state-of-the-art auto 
mechanic technician. I mean, he's passionate and just an absolute perfectionist at what he does. Um, I'd feel uh, kind of leery about, you know, n never seeing the person that's working on my car. It's like, it's like having surgery or something done on you and you never get to meet the, uh, the surgeon. You know, they put you out and someone you never meet comes in and cuts you open and does stuff. I mean, you wouldn't like that. You, you want to have some kind of, some kind of relationship with, you know, the person who's going to work on your body, your, your doctor. And so, um, so the price point of this mechanic is going to be a little bit higher than your average what it costs to get things done. But in my case, that's, for me, that's worth it. I don't mind that. So his price point is going to be a little to the right of the equilibrium, maybe 10 or 20%. But still, for, for me, it's well worth it because I want to know that. It's almost like an insurance. I want to know that car is going to start most likely. I mean, he can't guarantee this stuff. But most likely, I'm doing all I can to have a very competent person look at it. You know, in dealerships and, and people who hide the mechanic in the back, I don't know if that's going on. So that's just a, an example that sometimes uh, people have a price point that's actually higher than the equilibrium market price. Next is um, the distribution model. I mean, there's all kinds of way of getting products and service from point A to B, from the person who pr produces to the person who receives. Every industry is different, and there's a, a wide range of disseminating, distributing products and services uh, to clients and customers. So whatever that may be, whatever you specialize in, that might have a lot to do with how you segment the market in terms of internet distribution versus hand-to-hand -hand distribution versus UPS, FedEx, US mail distribution, get on the telephone, uh, 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 video conferencing, uh, go to meeting.com, you know, ty types of product service distribution. But whatever you do, it's something you have to understand as a model and how it works because it, it might be a real critical aspect of how you segment your marketplace uh, relevant to how you distribute your, your um, products and services. Okay, um, uh, the buying process. Um, uh, 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 how complex is the whole process of the selling uh, and, and buying of the goods and services that you're providing? So this is an image of the stock market. I mean, and if you have something you're selling on an open stock market, my God, the you know it takes years of accountants, of attorneys, and things like that, and millions of dollars in fees to organize a, an, or a corporation for. Uh, to be sold on the open, you know, NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, for example. It's very, very complicated. Um, or the process of buying a car and licensing and, and financing. And there's a lot, of, a lot of talent and understanding and knowledge goes into just how to make that, that happen. Um, credit ratings, etc. Or it could be just as easy as walking up to a counter and slapping down some bucks and picking up whatever you're buying and walking out the door with it. So... Is there a complex process or not? What goes into it? Is there, like, if you sell guns, you got to, you know, do background checks and things like that? So, th again, this is another aspect of uh, that might have much to do with how you segment your market to target your, your customer. The next thing you want to be aware of is, is what you're selling. Is it a whole product solution? Or is it a part to a product solution? So is it the whole, or is it some? So <clears throat> um, is it a complete? Is it a complete solution or a point product solution? So here I've got this this red sedan. That's a complete solution. Get in and start it and take off. But then I also have a transmission. We're selling transmission that goes in the car. We just as easily can have a little part that goes into the transmission into the car. So just kind of be aware. Is what you're selling a part of the whole or a breakdown of the sum? Because that might be some aspect that uh, you use in segmenting your market. Okay, so this is kind of an important but very simple looking graphic, but it's kind of important. So we kind of profile the things that are relevant to demographics and things that are relevant to psychographics. So relevant to demographics, age, gender, race, location, employment status, 
Um, we could also put employment that might be you know income uh, uh, employed unemployed, but I'm assuming that means how much you make. And then psychographics, or, or maybe full-time versus part-time employment, but anyway. But psychographics deals with things that are personality, values, attitudes, interests, lifestyle. So these are, this kind of gives you a feel for the difference between being someone in a market and how you demographically fall into that market versus being someone in a market and your values, lifestyle or religion or politics and things of this sort. Um, and um, being aware of this stuff, which absolutely exists, is something that we have to absolutely be aware of from the standpoint of doing segment market segmentation. Again, the better we can segment the market, the more likely we are to be more effective and efficient in distributing our marketing and advertising. So the next few slides are going to deal with <clears throat> how we look at the whole to segments of the whole down to the most who's most likely going to buy our products and services and how to put a price on the, the value of our market. So this slide is, is entitled, you know, market segmentation. And if we look at the bottom here, <clears throat> it goes, um, uh, you know, the mass market, the total, the total market. <clears throat> and then we're looking at geography, the location, and then demographics, how we're going to sort that location into demographic categories. And then <clears throat> how we're going to take that and, and break that down into psychographic categories and then how we're going to then take a look at that in terms of what are the benefits that this psychographic category is looking for and then now we're going to look at the usage rate. How often are they going to buy these goods and services on a monthly annual basis and then voila, there's our target. There's our, our you know, our, our, our target customer that we're after. And how are we going to get to that person? You know, now by knowing this information, we're more likely to have a realistic and logical market development approach to it in terms of uh, trying to figure out people who are in the target market, what kind of magazines do they read? Um, what's the, what do they do on weekends? Um, how can I be the same place they are to meet them and create a personal relationship? Who are the mavens? Who are the connectors um, uh, in this market? Uh, another, by the way, another uh, really great aspect of my uh, the book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. He outlines how social networks work, and and reading that book really starts to help you understand you know, uh, how valuable it is to meet, you know, a connector or a maven within a market. And if you create a relationship there, that person then turns around and, and, and communicates, shares uh, knowledge about you to hundreds of other people. 80% of all opportunities comes from a third party person who refers your name. So, you know, putting this time in can help you understand how to segment and get to the person who in turn turns around and, 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 and shares your name with a hundred other people. So one contact can be like, a pr in a more powerful way, contacting a hundred other people because of the referral aspect. The next slide here is graphically shows you got the total market. In this case, it's called the how um, the total available market, a total available. So that might be the you know the population. In the Greater Los Angeles area, you could say 17.8 million people. Now, chances are not they're all not probably going to be interested in whatever you're selling, but a, a very large segment probably would be. The next is um, the serviced available market. Who's who are real life going to need your product and services in terms of what are you selling to whom you're selling? And then the actual target market getting into psychographics and things like that, um, distribution, all the things we just got talking about could be the actual target market. And, and one of the reasons, and let me click this, the one of the reasons we do this is if we take the total market and if we can somehow say, you know, the service market or the t total potential market is a certain percent, and if we can come down and say, even if it's like of 17.8 million people, there's a potential market of 3.5% or 1.5% times, okay, so we got average price times the number of potential of actual customers in that client, 
that was that's how we'd come up and put the potential market value and sometimes these numbers are really big so some that which gives you much incentive to compromise barriers of, of entry to get in a business so kind of keep this in mind this is a way we can put a value on 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 the market and it's quite inspiring uh, because there's a lot of work that goes into just starting a business before you even get in the business I mean it's sometimes two and a half years before your business takes off so that's a lot of dedication you got to have to get something off the ground that's again why it's important to have alignment because by aligning it takes 10,000 hours in an industry before the industry embraces you before things take off and this gets back to Glad Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote a book called um, the outliers and just was how successful people became successful uh, Beatles Gates um, you know uh, athletic stars etc and you know much of it's at the right place at the right time but in all cases uh, uh, all s extremely successful people had over t Beethoven uh, had over 10,000 hours logged in doing what they're doing in terms of practicing over and over and over and over and over again before um, the exponential growth curve of, of, of success took off now we want to talk a bit about um, profiling our market competitor and um, uh, and sometimes this is kind of hard because competitors don't really publish all the information they have and this gets gets back to just being around the industry slowly but surely you, you acquire uh, this information and we're about to introduce to you seven categories of competitor information and again I've got the Malcolm Gladwell's uh, tipping point book up here uh, because um, as we learn this information we might also be learning what our customers are or are not doing that actually represent an opportunity for you to take advantage of, of as a business so the very first category up here is, uh, in terms of what is the competitor strategy how do they get their customer now here's an example I have a uh, I, uh, well, I don't know what to say friend but I know this guy who's got a chiropractic business in Pasadena and the chiropractic business is pretty competitive of, uh, amongst chiropractors and some time ago he started a running club and this club became, has become very very successful it's very large and um, uh, and all of his customers tend to come through word of mouth through this running club and so this is a way where a competitor might start a nonprofit uh, and all the customers come through the relationships that are developed through the nonprofit or um, they're very active in their church or political party or um, activism uh, uh, in terms of, of um, uh, you know environmental uh, causes uh, you know there's all things you know word of mouth references comes through relationships that are entered into under non-threatening basis and so all businesses have unique and different strategies that might be uh, aligned with what makes the CEO or, or the owner of that business uh, uniquely different as an individual taking the time to understand the strategy of how your competitors get their customers is going to be very enlightening because uh, you could maybe do the same thing and it also might uh, help you understand what is it that you're passionate about that uh, that gives you a, a non-threatening vehicle to meet people uh, that could turn <coughs> become potential customers someday next is a competitors uh, research and developer innovations is there anything they're doing that's just totally different than what other people do you know there's there are businesses that are like dinosaurs they keep you know uh, they, they use just old-fashioned you know no technology you know tools and sometimes they're better than the technology but that's just maybe how they how they do what they do uh, and then there's competitors that just everything's computerized you got to have a you know a, 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 a bachelor's degree in computer science to be able to understand how to use the stuff um, and everything in between 
So you want to take a look at what kind of innov innovations or technology that your competitors use, and are you doing the same thing, and or not, or, or maybe you should be, you know. But that's something. It's a category of of of, of analysis. The next is uh, your competitor's market perception. I mean, everyone can have different perceptions of a marketplace. How does your competitor see a market as dying, growing? Uh, uh, are they developing new market uh, uh, profit centers? Uh, are they investing? Are they, um, you know, I remember back with, you know, they, uh, like for instance, we can take a look at technology and, and um, you know, CDs. I mean, you know, iTunes has replaced these kinds of things. So, you know, so in pa uh, competitors who are in, investing in forms of archaic technology, well, it, there still could be demand, but it's, but the, you know, the, the, you know, they're going to be in a very unique category. Uh, and there will always be people for the old-fashioned way of doing it. And so, um, uh, being aware of how competitors perceive a market and capitalize on that could be very valuable. Uh, next is <clears throat> um, competitor detections. What this means is, what kinds of things does a competitor do that might be a secret? You know, that's that's not on the surface and no one talks about it, but they they have clandestine ways of doing things. You know, things that you'd have to be on the inside of the, you know, company, you know, industrial espionage kind of things. But, you know, is there anything going on that's really secret? Um, <clears throat> and try to detect on, on uh, the detection, detection of some of these kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> Next is just general competitor profile, number of employees, years of business, <coughs> annual sales, square foot of sales space, profit centers, just, just a myriad of profiling information. And this information is going to be valuable because we're soon I'm going to, we're going to introduce you to <coughs> what's called a competitor comparison table. And, and, <coughs> and we can populate a, a, a competitor comparison table with this kind of information. All of this stuff can fit into a competitor comparison table, which we want to do because it it shows that you're streetwise. You just—it's one of those things you kind of have to do. And then uh, next is um, value proposition. Now, a number of videos that we've presented up to this point talk about the value proposition ladder. You know, what's the bait? How can we have some kind of relationship where there's no transaction, uh, but there's value, such as the guy who got the running club going? Well, he gives free advice to people in terms of their sore backs and that kind of stuff. Um, but then, uh, if the problem persists, there's a working relationship, and they come up to him and go, um, say, doctor so-and-so, um, uh, I really feel I need to see you as a doctor and says, well, come on in and he sign him up and insurance company information and now he's billing this guy $200 a week every time he comes in and, 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 and sees him. So it's good to have some kind of perception and, and or string of profit center and services where there can be a minimum entry point that leads to another, another level, to another level, to another level. You know, you just don't come in and say, oh, sure, come on in and there's $10,000 diagnosis fee. Well, oh, that's an awful lot of money. I think I'll, I think I won't come in. So <clears throat> it's good to have a, a ladder, uh, levels of of sales points <coughs> uh, to guide a customer client through, so you don't you know scare them away with your ultimate objective. Um, and uh, so to be aware, does does your competitor have any kind of value propositional ladder system in place? And finally, uh, the financial profile of the customer. How, 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 what's their overall market value and, uh, and success from that standpoint? So all these things uh, deal with um, uh, how to assess our competitor. We're almost done. This is a, kind of a long session here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about barriers of entry, and then we'll, be, we'll wrap it up. So uh, mar barriers to market entry can deal with market um, cultures, um, uh, uh, credit and financing, do you have the, the ability to financially get in the market? Um, uh, market makeup, um, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, so th this is an aspect that, uh, of, 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 of uh, market barriers that has to be compromised. Um, operations and supply chain, government regulations, um, 
uh, competing br uh, brands are all things that deal with barriers of entry. Every industry, every market's different. Uh, it's just so be aware and try to identify the barriers of entry that might exist before you start the whole process of getting in because you don't want to put all this money, all this life into getting a business to get in the market and find out there's some aspect of the market like you need a liquor license or something like that that's just absolutely impossible to obtain for some kind of regulation reason and and, and you find that out two years later and $10,000 put into developing a business to get in the market and find out you can't get the license to, to exist in the market. This is a quickie example of, of bar. This, so this is Amazon. This is the Amazon logo down here. Let's say if you wanted to compete with Amazon, can you imagine the high, uh, e e uh, the economies of scale? How much money would it create that you have to invest to have economies of scale to do what they do? Um, same thing with um, high learning curve. I mean, all the computers and distribution technology that goes in to what Amazon does. Uh, the capital requirements, warehouses, uh, assembly, distribution lines, racks, computerization. And then the other thing is any kind of business can hook up to their model and any kind of distribution can hook up to their model. So they're in a almost... Um, you know, a, a category killer under themselves. They, they kind of have become the the distribution system for so many you know products in, in in the industry, and it's to the point where you can almost buy a car through Amazon. You know, you order a car, click, and a brand new car is delivered to your door. So they it just so. You know, so that's just an example of just the impossible barriers that some industries can have. Um, the next is a, compar a compar competitor comparison table, and we populate these with just all this information relevant for a company, for all these categories by which you might compare competitors with. And uh, uh, and then this is just an example. In other videos, I talked about um, uh, the organization I, I, I worked on getting off the ground. Uh, in not such a successful way, but it, it might have another breath of life in it at some point called Veggie Pack. But here's a competitor uh, comparison table that I developed for the Veggie Pack organization. And it just takes a look, uh, look at different types of competitors and, and are, you know, where, what is the level of threats relevant to um, categories of short range, intermediate range, long range competition type situations. And then finally, profiling your, your uh, market position, and this is where we do uh, a SWOT analysis, identifying our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and threats. And here are some examples of, you know, different types of um, strengths and weaknesses. This video is getting a little bit long, so you can always stop the video and study this. And, and, and if you're a student in the class, um, you'll get a, a PDF of the PowerPoint here that you can uh, download. Uh, and then next is a, uh, a market position uh, or strategic map diagram which uh, is profiles the mission statement. But this is another way of, of showing your market position in terms of product services, broad to narrow, customers and clients, broad to narrow, and where you are located in here symbolizes market share. Know that businesses that gravitate to the outer perimeter of the strategic map diagram are overwhelmingly more successful in, than businesses that gravitate towards the center, because businesses gravitate towards the center trying to be all products and services to all customers. Again, understanding the supply and demand model in terms of, of understanding your market position. And I think we're pretty close to wrapping things up. Um, and then, uh, uh, the market analysis as we uh, go through it, be aware that we're probably going to learn a, a lot, much, that's going to maybe uh, trigger the rewriting of our mission statement, um, redefining our vision of success statement, restructuring our organizational structure or our business model, and uh, redesigning our phase of competitive development. So, there it be, so this is why we often say that we have to go through the business plan development process three times before we get it right. And the first time we, we go through a market analysis, we are no doubt going to learn an awful lot that's going to trigger the, uh, the redesigning and, and writing and development of these four sections of our, of our business plan. Again, uh, be aware of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point 
It's absolutely essential to uh, seeing and identifying uh, opportunities uh, as well as potential threats within the marketplace. And the more we can identify and the more we can train for them, the more we can respond to them instantaneously. Um, so in, in summary, the market analysis is all about de defining the point of entry into the market, clearly understanding uh, um, whom we're selling to and, and how to profile that, also understanding our competition and, and how to uh, view and, and, and understand what differentiates uh, us in the market from our competition and all the categories to assess our competition with. Um, and then finally, uh, how to understand our overall general market position. And this was a, an awful long uh, session. I uh, thank you for hanging in there. And so that concludes our talk on how to conduct a market analysis. And we'll see you at our next video.